summary history. Uh, in our Bibles, it's been broken up, First and Second Chronicles, and then Ezra uh, follows to, to sort of fill in and give us more information about the, the return from captivity and <clears throat> the rebuilding of the temple and, and the walls. So I'm going to be looking at that tonight. I want you to turn your Bibles to, first, to Ezra, chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 3, then we're going to look at chapter 7, verse 10. These are key verses. You'll see them come up again uh, in a little while. Stand with me, if you would, as I read from uh, these two verses in the book of Ezra. This is the Edict of Cyrus, king of Persia. Of course, Persia is our modern-day Iran. I think it's, there's a certain uh, interest here that they were in captivity in Babylon, which is modern-day Iraq, and uh, the king of Persia conquered Babylon and then set them free. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Then chapter 7, verse 10, for Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord, and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. This is the inerrant, un infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And we're going to learn some things tonight. We're going to see Jesus, the, 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 uh, the heart of Jesus, in recovering and redeeming and forgiving. And we're also going to see how the history continues, the Davidic dynasty continues, the promises of the Messiah coming continue to grow even in the face of what looked like uh, hopelessness, hope springs. Thank you. Please be seated. Ezra, uh, this book, continues the Old Testament narrative of Second Chronicles, uh, and it shows how God fulfilled his promise to return his people to the land of promise after 70 years of, of exile. It's sometimes called the second exodus. Uh, because just as they were in bondage in Egypt uh, many years before, they're now in bondage in Babylon and are going to be set free to return. It's a, it's a less impressive exodus. Millions of people left Egypt. Uh, thousands. Given the opportunity to come back uh, to Jerusalem, only thousands return. There's some lessons in that as well. Ezra relates the story of, of two returns from Babylonia. The first, it's led by Zerubbabel uh, to rebuild the temple, and the second, under the leadership of Ezra, to rebuild the spiritual condition of the people. So chapters 1 to 6 and chapters 7 to 10, we'll see, that, see the flow of that. In between these two accounts, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, there's a period of about 60 years, 58, 60 years. And that is when Esther lives uh, and rules as queen in Persia. And so that'll, you see the flow of that chronologically. We'll kind of piece that together for you a little later. What we're going to do right now, we're going to pray, and then we're going to watch the uh, Bible Project video. It's a video of, of Ezra Nehemiah, treated as one book. So we'll do like we've done in the past. When we come back to this study uh, a couple of weeks, We'll watch this again for the Nehemiah part of it. But right now we're going to watch the Bible Project video of Ezra and Nehemiah. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah. In most modern Bibles, these books are separate, but that division happened long after it was written. It was originally a unified work written by a single author. The story is set after the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and its temple and took many of the people into exile. And this book picks up about 50 years later and tells the return of some Israelites to Jerusalem and then what happened when they rebuilt the city and their lives there. Specifically, the book focuses on three key leaders who led the rebuilding efforts. You have Zerubbabel, then Ezra, and then Nehemiah. And the book's design focuses on the efforts of each leader. Zerubbabel leads a large group of people back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Then about 60 years later, Ezra arrives in Jerusalem to teach the Torah and rebuild the community. And then he's followed by Nehemiah, who leads the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls. 
And these three stories are designed to be parallel. Each begins with the king of Persia prompted by God to send the leader to Jerusalem and he offers resources and support and then each leader encounters opposition in their efforts which they then overcome but in a way that leads to a strange anticlimax in each of the three parts. Let's back up and see how it fits together. So the story begins with a decree from Cyrus, the king of Persia, and he's moved by God to allow the exiles to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And the author says this fulfills a promise made by the prophet Jeremiah that the exiles would one day return to Jerusalem. Now, this fulfillment should trigger our hopes in the many other prophetic promises that exile was not the end of the story. We have hope for a future messianic king from the line of David. We have hope for a rebuilt temple where God's presence will dwell with his people. Hope for God's kingdom to come over all the nations and bring his blessing, just like he promised Abraham. And so it's with all these hopes in mind that we read on into the story of Zerubbabel. His name means planted in Babylon. He represents the generation born in Babylonian captivity and he leads a wave of Israelites returning to Jerusalem. After they settle there, they rebuild the altar for offering sacrifices and later the temple itself. The foundation laying ceremony and then the temple's final dedication, these are key moments. The past stories of the tabernacle and temple's dedication should be in our minds. This is when the fiery cloud of God's presence is supposed to descend, he's dwelling with his people, and it doesn't happen. And so while some people are happy about this new temple, the elders who had seen the previous temple of Solomon, they cry out in grief. It is nothing like their glorious past or their hopes for the future. And it's right here that we get the first story of opposition, and it's very odd. So the grandchildren of the Israelites who were not taken into exile, they had been living in Jerusalem all along, they come to offer help with the temple rebuilding. And Zerubbabel refuses. He says, you have no part in our temple. And this, of course, generates a conflict which Zerubbabel overcomes, but it's very strange because the prophets had envisioned that the tribes of Israel would all come together along with all of the nations to participate in the worship of the God of Israel when the kingdom finally comes. So this is an anticlimactic moment to say the least. In the next section, we zoom forward about 60 years and we're introduced to Ezra. He's a leader among the exiled Israelites in Babylon. And he's a Torah scholar and a teacher. And so he gets appointed by Artaxerxes, king of Persia, to lead another wave of people back to Jerusalem. And Ezra wants to bring about spiritual and social renewal among the people. Our hopes are high. And again, we come to another anticlimactic moment in the story. Ezra learns that many of the exiled Israelites that had come back, they had made married non-exiles who had been living around Jerusalem. Some of them were non-Israelites and almost certainly some of them were. Ezra then appeals to the commands of the Torah that Israel was supposed to be holy and separate from the ancient Canaanites. And he then says that the people living around Jerusalem are like the Canaanites. They're going to corrupt the exiles. So Ezra offers a prayer of repentance and it's very heartfelt. But then he rallies all the leaders and enacts this divorce decree that says all these marriages should be annulled the women and children sent away. And then the decree is only partially carried out. We're given a list of some of the men who divorced their wives. The story is very strange for a number of reasons. First of all, God never commanded Ezra to do any of this. It was the leaders of Jerusalem who led Ezra to make the decree. Second, the contemporary prophet Malachi, he did say that the exiles should care about purity, but he also said that God was opposed to divorce. And so the mixed results of the decree, this all fits into this pattern of a strange concluding anticlimax. Which leads us to the next section about Nehemiah. He's an Israelite official serving in the Persian government. And when he hears about the ruined state of Jerusalem's walls, he prays and then gets permission from the Persian king Artaxerxes to go and rebuild the walls. The king even gives them an armed escort and all these resources. So after arriving in Jerusalem, he begins the building project and he too faces opposition from the people who had already been living around Jerusalem. Once again, we face a tension in the story. The contemporary prophet Zechariah said that the new Jerusalem of God's kingdom would be a city without walls, that God's presence would surround it, that people from all nations would come and join the covenant people. But Nehemiah seems to operate with the opposite vision. He informs the people surrounding Jerusalem that they have no part in Jerusalem. And this, of course, provokes them to hostility. And so while 
Nehemiah carries out his vision for the city with integrity and courage. They have to build the city with armed guards to protect them. We keep wondering, could this whole conflict have been handled differently? And this all leads to the conclusion of the book in two movements, first positive and then negative. Ezra and Nehemiah combine forces to bring about a spiritual renewal among the people. They gather all the exiles together for a festival. They read and teach the Torah to all the people for seven days. And then they celebrate the ancient Feast of Tabernacles to remember God's faithfulness from the Exodus and the wilderness journeys. Then they offer a confession of their sins. They vow themselves to renew the covenant, follow all the commands of the Torah. And they finish with a great celebration over the temple, the walls of Jerusalem, and we're thinking, thinking this could be the turning point, but it's not. The book ends on a huge downer. Nehemiah tours around the city, and he finds that the people have not been fulfilling their covenant vows. So Zerubbabel's work is undone as he finds the temple being neglected and staffed by all these unqualified people. He then discovers that Ezra's work is being compromised. He finds everyone violating the Torah, people are working on the Sabbath, and even his own work on the walls is involved because people are setting up markets around the walls of Jerusalem and working on the Sabbath. So Nehemiah, he goes on a rampage. He's beating people up, he's pulling out their hair, and he's yelling, obey the commands of the Torah. And his final words are a prayer that God would remember him, that at least he tried, and the book ends. I mean, it's very strange, but we've been prepared for it, right? These anticlimactic moments have been woven into the book's design intentionally. And so it raises the question, what on earth does this book contribute to the storyline of the Bible? Well, remember, the book started by raising our hopes in the prophetic promises about the Messiah, the temple, the kingdom of God, and then none of it happens. So even though Israel is now back in the land, their spiritual state seems unchanged from before the exile. And while Ezra and Nehemiah, they do their best, but their political and social reforms among the people don't address the core issues of their heart. So what the book is pointing out is the same need highlighted by the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel. What God's people need is a holistic transformation of their hearts if they're ever going to love and obey their God. And so the book ends on a downer, yes, but it forces you to keep reading on into the wisdom and prophetic books to find out what is God going to do to fulfill his great covenant promises. But for now, that's the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra tonight, Nehemiah in a couple of weeks. The, uh, the storyline takes place with them being in Persia and being... Uh, set free by Cyrus, moving to Jerusalem. It's broken down into, into two, uh, two parts. The restoration of the temple takes on from chapter 1, 1 through chapter 6, verse 22. Uh, that's about a 22-year period from 538 to 516 B.C. The, uh, this in includes the first uh, return to Jerusalem, first wave of captives coming back to Jerusalem. And then uh, Zerubbabel, and, and you recognize, I hope you see his name, uh, Zerub Babel. Uh, he was planted in the land. He, he's, a, he's, a, he's indigenous to Babylon, born uh, as a Jew there in captivity. Zerubbabel, who by the way also is, is in the Messianic line. He's in the line of David. Uh, he leads the first return, about 50,000, just shy of 50,000 uh, captives come back to Jerusalem. And then the construction of the temple is underway, chapter 3, verse 1 to chapter 6, verse 22. So contrasted with that, the first part of the book, the restoration of the temple is the reformation of the people. Uh, it's, it's, not the, it's not the physical building, it's the spiritual building. But I've told you before, you should be familiar by now, that, that for the Jews at this time in their history, <clears throat> um, a physical temple is critical to them recognizing or hoping that God is present with them, that their spiritual well-being will be intact. So that, this is about a one-year period that, uh, that this addresses in the last part of the book. It's the second turn, return from captivity. Uh, Ezra leads the second return, and then there's this restoration of the people of God. Um, as Ezra is continuing the story uh, from Second Chronicles, uh, showing how God, <clears throat> excuse me, God's promise to... Uh, to bring his people back to their land is fulfilled. Look at Jeremiah with me, Jeremiah 29, 
10 to 14. We'll see verse 14 again later on in the study. But For thus says the Lord, this is the, this is the prophet Jeremiah speaking for the Lord. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I'll restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. The promise, the prophetic promise, uh, while, <laughs> as they were going into exile, that they would come back. And you see this, we've seen this plenty of times now in our study through the Old Testament, how, how God speaks through one of his, his mouthpieces to promise a return, to promise a restoration. Uh, it's the assurance that God is with this people. Uh, and they may not be experiencing the glory days of the temple uh, of Solomon. They still have a hope and a spiritual heritage that's, that's unfolding as God's promises are fulfilled and are being fulfilled with the hope that his future promises will be fulfilled. As Ezra tells us about the, the, two, the first two returns, there's a third one, by the way, that we'll look at when we get to Nehemiah. Uh, they're, they're decades apart. As we think about this first six chapters, the restoration of the temple, uh, this is set in motion by King Cyrus of Persia, modern-day uh, Iran, overthrowing Babylonia in 539 B.C., in 538 B.C., he issues this decree. It allows the Jews to return. This is another interesting prophetic aspect of this. Isaiah prophesied two centuries before this. Look at Isaiah chapter 44, the end of that, and then the first part of chapter 45. He prophesied two centuries before this that the temple would be rebuilt, and he names Cyrus. Look at this passage. In Isaiah 44, verses 24 to 28, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of liars and makes fools of diviners, who turns wise men back and makes their knowledge foolish, who confirms the word of his servant and fulfills the counsel of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited, and of the cities of Judah, they shall be built, and I will raise up their ruins, who says to the deep, be dry, I will dry up your rivers, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall fulfill all my purpose. Saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built, and of the temple your foundation shall be laid. Keep on reading in chapter 45. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who called you by your name. For the sake of my servant, notice this, the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I called you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. It's a fascinating passage, I think that the prophecy actually names the king when he's not a king who will rise up. And some of, and some of the study I was doing here suggests that perhaps Cyrus was made aware of this, of this prophecy, and acted in response, was impressed, because he speaks of the God of Jerusalem. Uh, so we told you about 50,000 uh, take advantage of the, of the opportunity. Uh, many stayed in Babylon. Uh, they had grown accustomed to the comforts, even though they were in captivity. They'd grown accustomed to being there. And the heart that they had that grieved and moaned when they, when they were taken out of uh, their land, they've now adapted. This, there's a lesson there for all of us. If we're not careful, we can, we can just adapt to lukewarm surroundings if we, if we do not continually, earnestly seek the Lord. I told you Zerubbabel, he's a, a prince called a prince. He's of the Davidic line. Um, 
he, when he goes in and does his restoration, I don't know if, you're, if you've read this enough to, for me, he first restores the altar and the religious feasts before he begins the work on the temple itself. The foundation of the temple is laid in 536 B.C. Then opposition arises, uh, and this, this shows up uh, in chapter 4, verses 6 to 23. The work ceases for about 14 years, from 534 to 520, uh, because, and, and of course our, our video showed us that, that Zerubbabel sort of brought the, brought the opposition on himself. It's a, it's a fascinating thing you see at, at this stage in Israel's history. They are on the receiving end of amazing blessings of God, being, being allowed to return from captivity. But you see that they're becoming more and more of a nationalist people. They're not at all looking uh, to advance the name of God so that the, the nations may worship him. And you, this bigotry comes out even in, these, in the leader like Zerubbabel and then, and then like Ezra. Uh, and so it's a, real, it's a real mixed response to God's goodness. And again, I think we need to be careful about that. Then we're only being on the receiving end of God's blessings that we do not become a closed-minded people reaching out to those who are, <clears throat> who are different, who are not like us. And I think it's a huge, a huge uh, flaw in Zerubbabel and, as we'll see, in, uh, in Ezra. The prophets at this same time, you look at chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, the prophets Haggai and Zechariah exhort the people to get back to building the temple. And so the work begins again under Zerubbabel. And there's this Joshua the high priest who, who comes on the scene. Then there's a, a, a Persian governor, Tatantai. Uh, and he protests to the king, to King Darius the first, about the temple building. And uh, he challenges the, the propriety of this continuing. And it doesn't go well for him. King Darius uh, finds the decree of Cyrus, confirms it, and then turns around and forces Tatanai to provide whatever is needed to complete the work. It's finished in 515 B.C. So Tatanai ends up having to bring personal uh, financial support to this work uh, for his outcry. That's, that's the first part of, of, uh, of, of Ezra. second part of it is Reformation of the People, chapter 7 to 10. Uh, under, uh, under Ezra, uh, a smaller contingency, I don't know if I, if I mentioned this or not earlier. Let me go back to that. Uh, under Ezra, only about 1,750 return. And there's not a lot of uh, Levites. That's, a, that's an interesting thing. Uh, many priests, <clears throat> and this is, this is going to be the spiritual emphasis of restoring worship of God. And Ezra is described as, a, as an expert in the Torah, the expert in the law, to teach the law. And there's a, in, in chapter 2, verses 36 to 42, uh, you see this, this uh, information about the priests uh, that come back. And uh, I want to, let me read to you uh, Ezra 8, 15 to 19. <clears throat> Excuse me. I gathered them to the river that runs in Ahava, and there we camped three days. As I reviewed the people and the priest, I found there none of the sons of Levi. Then I sent for Eliezer, Ariel, Shemaiah, Elnathan, Jareb, Elnathan, Nathan, uh, Zechariah, and Meshulam, leading men, and for Joyarib and Elnathan, who were men of insight, and sent them to Edo, the leading man at the place in Kasaphia, telling them, what to say to Edo and his brothers and the temple servants at the place, Casaphia, namely to send us ministers for the house of our God. By the good hand of our God on us, they brought us a man of discretion of the sons of Mali, the son of Levi, son of Israel, named Sherebiah, with his sons and kinsmen, about 18. Also Hashabiah and with him Jeshiah of the sons of Merari, with his kinsmen and their sons, 20. And so this so that you just gives you kind of how there was a paltry response uh, for folks coming back to work on the spiritual uh, side of this, of this return. God does use Ezra to rebuild the people spiritually and morally. Um, when he discovers about the intermarriage, uh, again, it's, there's, a, there's sort of a, a pressure point of how he handles it. Uh, identifies the sin of the people. He offers uh, repentance and a great intercessory prayer. And then... Uh, begins to separate the families out. And it's a very painful thing and it's somewhat questionable. 
in terms of if this is the way, because Malachi does say, as I live, says the Lord, I hate divorce. And so you have yourself in a real moral tension uh, at this point. As I said earlier, uh, in the years between Ezra 6 and Ezra 7, the first part of the book and the second part, there's a space of about 58 years, and that is when, that is when Esther uh, is, is raised up uh, as, uh, as queen of Persia. Let me touch real briefly on the, on the title and the, and the authorship. Um, it has different, different names. Of course, we looked at different, different backgrounds. It's an Aramaic form of the Hebrew word azer, uh, which means help. And so it could be that the, his name uh, speaks of Jehovah helps. Jehovah is my help. Um, you were told in the video they were originally bound together, Ezra and Nehemiah, as one, as one book. Uh, just like Chronicles, and they're just viewed as one continuous history. Uh, the, se the separation is somewhat artificial. It's something that, that those who developed the canon of Scriptures have done through the years. <clears throat> it's an interesting thing. If you're familiar with uh, the apocryphal books, the, the apocrypha is a, is a group of books. You'll find them in the, uh, in the Douay version of the, of the Catholic Bible. They're books of religious uh, information around the period of, of the Old Testament, um, but they're not considered authentic or canonical, in term, inspired by the Lord. Uh, but there's this, uh, at, at one point, the Greek language version of the Old Testament uh, called Ezra and Nehemiah, Esdras Deuteron, in other words, second Esdras, and Esdras is one of the... Uh, it's in one of the apocryphal books, First Ezra, Esdras' is apocryphal book. Uh, the Latin title of it is, is Liber Primus, or the first book of Ezra. Uh, and then Nehemiah in the Latin Bible is called Second Ezra. Just, just some interesting tidbits for you. Ezra, we believe, is the author of this. Um, a lot of Jewish tradition, ex external witness, says that there's a portion of the... Uh, we read a portion of 728 through 915. is written in first person. It's Ezra speaking. And so he seems the likely one. And in the, in the vividness of the detail that, that you go into here uh, almost insists that it was an eyewitness to, uh, to these, uh, these later events. Uh, Ezra, the, the, book, the book has a distinctive priestly flavor about it. And Ezra, we know, had that background, as I said, was an expert. He's a descendant, by the way. If you trace his genealogy, uh, which pops up in different places, he's a descendant of Aaron, of uh, the Aaronic uh, priesthood. Studied and practiced and taught the law of the Lord. He's an educated scribe. Um, we're told in another apocryphal book, 2 Maccabees, that he had access to the library of written documents gathered by Nehemiah. And so he, he used this material, no doubt, in writing the book of Ezra, uh, and the story of, of Nehemiah as well. There's a tradition. We're not going to sink a lot of credibility, but I'll just, I'll just tell you this is another fascinating insight. Tradition holds that Ezra was the founder of the great synagogue where the canon of the Old Testament Scripture was settled. Uh, another tradition says he collected the biblical books into a unit that he originated the synagogue form of worship. So he was very instrumental in what we know today uh, to be the Old Testament and, and to understand worship in the Old Testament. He wrote the book probably between 457 B.C., uh, which, is, which is the event that we see in Ezra 7 to 10, and 444 B.C., which is when Nehemiah arrives in Jerusalem, the period that's covered by the book. So I'm almost just, this is an interesting uh, little tidbit here. While Ezra was being written, 457 to 444, the Gautama Buddha uh, was holding forth in India. Confucius was in China. And Socrates was in Greek. This little side, and I think that's kind of interesting to get a historical context here of what was happening in terms of, in terms of religion and philosophy around the world. Uh, I want to show you a table now that I found that I, I think it's a chronological relationship uh, of the books of, uh, of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Let's look at that if we can. In 457 
B.C., you have, you have Ezra, uh, Ezra 7 to 10, the second return. In 444 to 425 B.C., you have Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, and the third return. Is there a slide prior to that? Yes. In 538 and 515 B.C., you have Zerubbabel, Ezra 1 to 6, the first return from captivity. Look at 483 to 473, you have the Esther and then the reign and then the book of Esther. So you, you kind of get a sense of, of what's going on uh, historically in the context with the writing of, of as we're heading into Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. I want you to look now at the, uh, at the flow of the kings, the Persian kings. Cyrus, of course, was the king at 559 to 530 B.C. Cambyses, we don't hear anything about him in the scripture, or Smerdis. Darius the first occurs 521 to 486 BC, and then Ahasuerus 486 to 464. Artaxerxes the first 464 to 423, and then Darius the second 423 to 404. Now, when you when you move this far in, you're getting you're getting into moving into the years of silence, the 400 years of silence, where there's no prophetic voice. But it just shows you kind of kind of where the Persian kings fit and how God used them. It's fascinating. Uh, the text we read earlier, that he's, uh, he, he's my hand, he's my shepherd. Uh, how God took him up uh, to make use of him. Let's see. About the theme and the purpose. The, the basic theme of Ezra is a, uh, a spiritual, moral, and social restoration of the remnant. If, you're, if you've read through the Old Testament, if you've had people teaching Old Testament uh, synopsis through the years, you probably familiar somewhat with the doctrine of the remnants, what it called. There's, there's always been a remnant. No matter how dark it's gotten in Israel's history, no matter how dark it's gotten in the early church history, God has always had a remnant. His, it, 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 there has been times in church history prior to the Reformation when it looked like gospel Christianity had all but disappeared. But God's always had a remnant, and, uh, and, and it crops up in different ways, shapes, and forms. Well, there is this, in, in Ezra, we see this remnant, because there was a whole lot more than 50,000 captives that were taken into captivity, and only a little over 50,000 returned. Uh, Israel's worship is revitalized. Uh, the people undergo a, a uh, ceremonial uh, cleansing. Uh, God's faithfulness is seen in that he sovereignly protects his people uh, by a powerful ember. Think about this. They were hauled off into captivity, and yet God sovereignly over, oversaw the Babylonian captivity so that at just the right time, he was ready to bring a remnant back. <clears throat> he oversaw the Persian Empire. So at just the right time, he raised up a king that, that crushed the Babylonians and then set the people of God free. So you see the sovereign ruling and overruling and intervening of God. There's, there's no other way to explain these events except the sovereignty of God. And, uh, <clears throat> and he shows his care for his people. There's a, there's a section where, uh, where when they come back, they, are, they, are, they take a lot of valuables, and they are guarded by a, a Persian armed guard. There's no other way. Think about how different this is. In the, in the wilderness wandering coming out of the Exodus, I mean, they, they were a mass of people, but they uh, they were, they were in their kindergarten stages of socialism in terms of being a society. They didn't know how to function with one another. Here, there's an armed escort that carries these captives and, their, and the valuable tools that they take with them, the valuable belongings they take with them, the things to build, to rebuild the temple, escorts them all the way back to Jerusalem. It's, it's a fascinating study in God's sovereign ruling and overruling and his sovereign providence. Uh, he provides them with leadership. Ezra has been, has been in captivity, has been poring over the law. He's an expert in the law. Zerubbabel, who's of the line of David, uh, is granted favor to leave, and now, now the messianic line of David is, is, is continuing to, uh, to, to grow and bud. I'll just remind you what we read earlier, Jeremiah 29, 14. Uh, there's this promise that God made, and what you need to see in the captivity and this, the themes of this is to see how God's fulfilling this. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore your fortunes and gather you from the nations, all the nations, and all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you to exile. So they're seeing, those who had experienced it, who are old enough to remember, are seeing it. Those who are not have been, 
hopefully have been taught in captivity, that God is fulfilling his promise. He is keeping his promise. The keys to Ezra, the, the key word, of course, would be the temple. It's, it's physical uh, building, but also what it represents. And it's fascinating what the, what the folks spoke about in the, in the video. When the tabernacle was finished, the Shekinah descended upon uh, the tabernacle. When the, the temple of Solomon was finished, the Shekinah descended upon the tabernacle. When this temple is rebuilt, the Shekinah does not descend. It's a, it's a new way that God is preparing his people for how he's going to relate to them. And they're terribly distraught because that is the symbol that they know of, of God's presence, of God's pleasure, of God's protection. It doesn't happen. The key word is the temple. The key verses we read earlier, I'll simply cite them for you again. Ezra 1.3, uh, the decree of Cyrus, Ezra 7.10, the uh, statement about Ezra's uh, preparation. The key chapter is chapter 6, which records the, the dedication of the temple, the completion and dedication of it. Uh, they keep the Passover. You know, we, we celebrate the Lord's Supper this morning, recognizing the Passover transition. These folks had not celebrated Passover in decades. It had to be a, had to be a moving moment. Think about, put yourself there. For those who had not celebrated the Passover for so long. And then for those who were born in captivity and are there to, to experience the Passover, uh, had to be a gripping time to remember, and particularly in the light of how they celebrated, that they've just been released from captivity and come back. What about Christ? Where do we see Jesus in Ezra? Well, we, we, see, we see the... Uh, the character of Jesus as God continues to fulfill his promise to keep David's descendants alive. Zerubbabel, one of those. So the line of David has not been cut off. There may not be a throne that one of David's sons is sitting on at the moment, but the line of David has not been cut off. It is still unfolding. Uh, in fact, he is uh, one of the genealogies. He's the, he's the grandson of Jeconiah, and that's recorded in First Chronicles and also in Matthew 1, 12, and 13, if you look at the, at the genealogy. This note of hope, because the remnant has returned to the land of promise. It's in this land that many of the messianic promises are given, and so when they're in captivity, how can, how can the Lord fulfill his promises when we're not even in the land where these things will unfold? Because we know that Christ will be born in Bethlehem. That's one of the prophecies, not in Babylonia. Uh, but the book of Ezra as a whole typifies Christ's work of forgiveness and restoration. And even though the story doesn't go the way we'd like for it to go, and the people, uh, finally, when all is said and done, you move through Ezra and Nehemiah, you haven't seen that much of a, of a spiritual change in them. God is still faithful. He's working. He has, his, he has his people. He's still working at his promises. He's moving toward the conclusion that he has promised. Ezra, by the way, in terms of his contribution to the whole, uh, to the Bible, it fills in the history of these first two returns from Babylonian captivity. Uh, and the book of Nehemiah, as I said, will cover the third. It, it forcefully emphasizes the power of the Word of God and the crucial need to obey it at every level of life. And that's how I want us to, I want us to close out tonight, looking at these passages of Scripture that are found in Ezra. And just notice the role of the Word of God, the role of the law. Let's read through these together. Ezra 1.1, 1, 1. Do, do you have that? There we go. In the, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it into writing. Of course, we read the proclamation earlier. Chapter 3, verse 2. Then arose Jeshua, the son of Jezodic, Jezodic with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, with his kinsmen, and they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So there's, there's beginning to be a stirring and a, a remembrance, a recognition, a return to the word of God. Ezra 6, 14. The elders of the Jews built and prospered uh, through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo. They finished their building by decree of, of the God of Israel and by decree of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes Artaxerxes, king of Persia. So they recognized that, that God used these, these human instruments who made decrees to enable them, but it's God who is moving. Chapter 6, verse 18. 
They set the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their divisions for the service of God at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. Ezra 7, 6. This Ezra went up from Babylonia. He was a scribe, skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord the God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all that he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. So here's a man skilled in the law who's going to lead the spiritual reformation. 7.10, for Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord, to do it and to teach his statutes. So he set his heart upon it to know it, to do it, and to teach it. This is, this is what, by the way, that is a model for a disciple maker, to know the word of God, to practice the word of God, and to share the word of God. And Ezra, Ezra is a great model of that for us. Ezra 7.14, for you were sent by the king and his seven counselors to make inquiries about Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of your God which is in your hand. Chapter 9, verse 4. Then all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the faithfulness of the returned exiles gathered around me while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. So there, there's this trembling at the word of God. Chapter 10, verse 3. Therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and their children according to the counsel of my Lord and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Again, citing the law of God, as, as the video pointed out, uh, the Lord did not call upon to do this. This was the, the elders, the leaders, who reminded him of what the law said about intermarriage. And then chapter 10, verse 5. Then Ezra arose and made the leading priests and Levites and all Israel to take an oath that they would do as had been said. So they took the oath, in other words, the oath to honor the Scriptures. The reason is, I don't know if I said this earlier or not, the reason that, that Ezra follows Chronicles in our Scripture is because it carries the story uh, from that point. Uh, even though in the Hebrew Bible it, it precedes the Chronicles. The Chronicles, it's, it's uh, Ezra and Nehemiah is the book just prior to the Chronicles, which is the last book of the Hebrew Bible. So that's, that's a sketch, an overview sketch of Ezra. Any questions or comments or observations?